Hello and welcome. My name is Nora Corcoran. Welcome to the Galway Travel Movement, Mishler Conversations, The Road to Ethnicity. In 2017, the Irish government formally recognised the travel community as an ethnic minority within Ireland. And this acknowledgement marked a significant milestone in the recognition of traveller culture, identity and history. And prior to this recognition, recognition travellers faced discrimination and marginalisation in various aspects of Irish society. And travellers who campaigned for many years hoped that the recognition of the recognition of ethnicity would finally address these issues and promote inclusivity and equality. As of today, March 21st, 2024, it has been seven years since this formal recognition and efforts continue to be made to ensure the rights and well-being of the traveller community in Ireland. And with this in mind, I'm delighted to welcome Martin Collins and Thomas McCann. And Martin is co-director of Paddy Point and, and Thomas has established and currently manages the Traveller Counselling Service, which was launched in 2008. And both men have fought tirelessly for many years to realise traveller rights and for formal recognition of traveller ethnicity. Welcome to Mishler Conversations, Thomas and Martin. Thanks very much. So I'm, I'm going to start off with a few questions. And um, I suppose what I'm going to go and I'm going to start with you, Martin. I'm going to ask you to, um, you know, to kind of talk about your journey to ethnicity. Maybe give us a little bit of background of your campaign and, um, you know, as I said, and the fight for formal recognition of the, for the traveller community and also what your vision is for the future. Well, thank you very much, Nora, and for the invitation to be part of this uh, really important discussion on the seventh anniversary of the acknowledgement of tribal ethnicity on the 1st of March uh, 2017. Obviously, this, this has been a really important issue for traveller and traveller organisations going back over 40 uh, plus years. I personally got involved in the campaign in 1985 when I first got involved with Dublin Travellers Education and Development Group, now Pabby Point. And I do know there were many other travellers involved in the campaign long before that. And I just want to acknowledge and pay tribute to the collective effort of travellers, travel men, travel women, and our settled supporters and allies, you know, over that long journey, uh, culminating in the acknowledgement of travel ethnicity in, two in 2017. So it was a, a, a collective effort uh, by all of us. So it was a very symbolic it was a very historic day for our community when the Din Taoiseach, Enda Kenny, stood up at the door and made that really important statement. Uh, and I say that because this was about pride. This was about respect. This was about self-esteem in who we are as a people. And in the absence of that acknowledgement of our ethnicity, our culture, our history, our language, our customs, our belief systems, our rituals, in the absence of that, you know, the, the prevailing analysis would continue to be that we're perceived as some sort of dropouts uh, uh, from the famine, uh, deviants, uh, failed settled people. And therefore, the only approach that needs to be taken is one of trying to civilise and normalise our people uh, and make us into settled people. And I describe that as a racist ideology. So I think that racist ideology, uh, I think, was put to bed when the Din Taoiseach made a really profound historic statement on the 1st of March 2017. And uh, now the challenge is how can we how can we build on that acknowledgement and how can we create you know better policies and implementation of policies to address you know the poor living conditions, the low education attainment, the high unemployment rate. Because the travel groups were very cl clear all along, you know, that the acknowledgement of travel ethnicity wasn't going to be a magic wand. You know, um, it wasn't going to solve you know issues of racism, inequality. Uh, as I said, poor living conditions, um, you know, low educational attainment, high unemployment. And what's needed there is an ongoing policy response. Uh, uh, you know, uh, for example, NITRIS, the National Travel Roam Inclusion Strategy now, uh, the second um, strat strategy has been developed as, as we as we speak. And we need to ensure that, you know, the objectives and the actions in that new strategy gets fully implemented and implemented. And that's the challenge. So the 1st of March, as I said, was a really historic day. Uh, for our people, um, you know, as, as I said, about recognition, pride, respect, and putting to bed that racist notion that we are misfits and deviants who need to be civilised and normalised by by, by the state. So now we need to see travel culture and identity uh, embedded in the school curriculum. Yeah, that's really important. Young travel children, you know, going to school need to see positive affirmation of their identity, their history, their language in the school curriculum. That doesn't exist. Uh, you could say we have a monocultural um, education system that only reflects primarily a white settled perspective, you know, on the world, and that has to change. So, 
And there is some moves afoot in that regard, which I welcome. I do know there was an expert committee looking at how that might happen. Uh, yeah, and they produced a report, I think it was last year. And uh, now we're waiting for the, for the Department of Education to, 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 to move on that. So I think, I think it's really important you know, because I think there was an expectation uh, out there among travelers, some travelers on the ground that once uh, the acknowledgement of ethnicity was, was you know, uh, took place, that suddenly everything would change. The travel organizations were very, very clear. That was never going to be the case. You know, uh, this was symbolic. Uh, it was historic uh, and we welcome it. But it's not going to deal with the hard core everyday issues and experience of travelers in terms of, you know, inadequate accommodation, um, low educational attainment, as I said. And we are working, the travel groups are working in partnership with the state in trying to develop, you know, effective policies to deal with those hardcore issues. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Martin. And and Thomas, I suppose like you could say that maybe your journeys were parallel, but I would say that you have your own different lived experience. Can you just give me kind of, I suppose, um, yeah, a bit about your background to the campaign and I suppose how yeah. you know how, how your journey got you to March yeah. first. Uh, yeah, um, um, my journey kind of I suppose started with Minkair Misley, which was a traveller only organization. Uh, and that came out of the Tala bypass protests, anti travel protests, and we put in counter protests. And so I uh, established Mickey Misley. And then Nan Jice ran for election in 1983. And it was from that time that we were lobbying from um, uh, for uh, ethnic rec recognition, you know. And, it, and as Martin said, there was many others settled allies. And then, of course, the Dublin Travelers Education and Development Group. and Many others played a, a huge role, but uh, you know there were, there has been decades of uh, of lobbying and activism uh, that went in, and you know from many activists and you know and indeed support from the European Union and and other bodies in terms of you know human rights bodies was is very important in this as well. So and that was after many decades. In terms of you know kind of. Uh, uh, being recognised and kind of uh, one was that there was a denial of what was happening to travellers was racism for starters. So by denying ethnicity, uh, traveller ethnicity, uh, the state could continue to deny that what was happening to travellers was racism. Uh, and I, I think that was a key establishing that, you know, uh, but as Martin said as well, in terms of prior to recognition, the claim was that travellers were dropouts from the famine and that really there were settled, failed settled people, a subculture of poverty uh, that needed to be rehabilitated and assimilated. And there was no recognition of the, so, I, so, to, so to kind of establish a, a foundation for rights, it was really, really important that recognition of traveler culture and ethnicity was, was recognized by the state so as we could build on that. Because without that foundation, it's really hard to establish then you know, uh, rights uh, based on uh, culture and ethnicity. Uh, so that was really, that was a key uh, piece in that. And as Martin said, around the curriculum, around getting travel culture into the curriculum and other things, I think. Um, but also, I think there's a sense of pride and, and particularly for younger travellers, uh, for different generations of travellers and with the trespass legislation and, and um, uh, you know, kind of, which is anti-nomadic, really. Uh, um, uh, you know, and that I identity crisis with some with some travelers in terms of uh, that, a sense of pride and who 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 we are and as a people you know that we do have an ancestry and we do have a history uh, that's equal to all other uh, uh, ethnicities whether it's settled or any other and that we're indigenous to this country that we're indigenous ethnic minority and i think that does uh, uh, frame the future in terms of establishing rights. I mean, what comes to mind, and I know they're not, it's not perfect or anything like that, is the Sami people, for instance, in Finland and, and Norway and, and up in that neck of the woods, you know, uh, where they have their own university. And their own, now I'm not saying that's where it'll end up for us, but certainly it gives us a, a, a strong foundation to build on. Yeah, and they have their own parliament as well. Like, I mean, have in, their own parliament, in Finland, yeah. and, uh, Finland, they have their own parliament. But if you look at both of your journeys, and we know, like, that, say, from when you started off, that, like, as, if you look at the development of time, and we and we look at the young people now, that what they would, I suppose, perceive as a traveller identity, 
is different from what you know you know you would have seen a journey and that's the, the reason i say that how how would you if you're they're listening now what would you say to them about the significance of formal recognition of a Nissi for Irish travellers, uh, Martin? Well, I, I, it's, 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 it's absolutely uh, essential for all of the reasons both Thomas and I have outlined. Uh, like our community has taken a hammering going back over not just decades, but centuries, you know, where there's been policies of forced assimilation, rehabilitation, integration, where we were perceived as being backward, deviant, needing to be normalised and civilised. And if you're subjected to that over a long period of time, and in our case, hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, that's going to impact on your psyche. And I think the term is called internalised oppression, where you become ashamed of who you are, you lack confidence, you lack pride in your identity. And that's essentially what the coloniser does. That's what the oppressor does. They, they, they colonise your mind. They think that you are inadequate that you are inferior to the majority population. And then shame sets in, and then all sorts of mental health issues, and we all, unfortunately, are very aware of the tragic mental health issues and the suicide rate in our community. I think that's directly related back to oppression, persecution, uh, cultural denial, uh, uh, and so on. So that's why I think the acknowledgement of... Um, and, I, and I use the word acknowledgement rather than recognition, uh, because you know it's acknowledging what was a reality. You know, it's not a question of recognizing, I, I, I don't think. It's getting the state to acknowledge what is self evident that we as a community constitute a distinct ethnic group. And all of the scholarly research, you know, from anthropologists, sociologists, and linguists around language have all pointed in that direction. So I think it was inevitable, you know, we would uh, arrive at the day when the state would, would do the right thing and acknowledge our, our ethnicity. So I think it is really important, uh, you know. Uh, you know, and I think it's a testament, actually, I think it's a testament to the strength and the resilience and the vision of the traveller activists, men and women and our supporters in the settled community that got us to that point in, in March, in March 1st, 2017. And, uh, and, and, you know, and I think it really have a very, will have a very important knock-on effect for the younger generation. And I see it, actually. I see, you know, I see the younger generation coming through now, young traveller activists, proud, confident, articulate, you know, um, Travers, young boys and girls, and I'll see. I also see it quite interesting on social media. A lot of young travelers reclaiming the language and using the language in social media, and I think that's just another manifestation of the, of the increasing pride and confidence in who they are, you know, as 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 a people. And, and we need to continue to uh, to to support that. So I just want to acknowledge, as I say, uh, you know, the strength and 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 uh, and the vision of all of the traveler activists and our supporters who played such a really important role in up to the, um, March 1st, 2017. And uh, I, I think we, should, we can all be very proud of, of our achievement. But, you know, the job is not done. The job is not done, as Thomas and I have said. There's, you know, there's hardcore everyday issues that we still need to deal with that I mentioned a while ago. Yeah, and and even following on from that part, we talk about hardcore. Thomas, like you were, you know, you said you established the Traveller Counseling Service. And then you would see a lot of, you know, the trauma, the trauma that obviously being denied for so long, you know what I mean, your 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 identity. And we see like a lot of travellers, a lot of young travellers have, have no sense of identity. And with that in mind, what would you say to them about the benefits of ethnic, you know, ethnic uh, recognition in the community? How, you know, because they might say to you, what's the point, Thomas? You know what I mean? But how do we just enforce that and embed that into our community and, and talk about the benefits of it? Even though it's symbolic, there has to be benefits. Yeah, absolutely. No, uh, there are benefits. And I think, you know, identity is really, really important for one sense of self in terms of, you know, it's like an anchor that anchors you. Mm -hmm. something. You know, otherwise you're, you know, you're, you're floating out there and you don't know where you are. It's like, you know, and I think that's part of it. And as Martin said about the internalized oppression, when you're when negative stereotypes are projected onto you all the time that you're that you don't come from anywhere, that you're really failed, said we internalize that and we we then kind of believe, start to believe that we're not good enough and that we can't do the same thing. And we become and also dependency cre is created in that and a whole lot of other things, but mental health, depression, anxiety kind of uh, you know, and all of them things stem from a, a lack of sense of solid identity. And I think that's really what it begins to establish in people. And it creates a foundation for that to be built on. 
you know, although people might use kind of um, hide their identity to kind of as a strategy to get into a job in themselves, they know they come from a, from a place. They know that they have that anchor somewhere, that they come from a, a people and they come from a, they have an ancestry. And I think that really helps people ground themselves in, in some ways. And I think that has created huge problems and continues to create huge problems. I think also, I think, you know, as Martin says, the acknowledgement rather than recognition, because we weren't given anything and anything that we got, we had to we had to fight very hard for as well, just to say that. But I think that uh, that that uh, acknowledgement of recognition uh, kind of um, uh, in some ways also kind of um, uh, creates a sense of, you know, uh, it, it begins to change the practice on a wider level as well over time. Uh, and although kind of we it's like it's like dropping a pebble into a river or into a, into a water, you know, then ripples get wider as time goes on, because like if anything is it, like travelers didn't even come into some of the like what comes to mind is recruiting for the guards, you know, looking for ethnic and before that acknowledgement of traveler uh, ethnicity. Travelers wasn't involved, couldn't, weren't seen in that frame because they weren't identified as an ethnic group, even though travelers was named in other pieces of work and legislation or mm -hmm. law as travelers, but not as an ethnic group. And I think that does have significance, you know. So, but for identity, I think it's really, really important, you know. Mm -hmm. I do see, mm -hmm. it, you know, kind of. And just on that point about legislation, I'm glad you brought that up because last year was like six years from the Commission of Itinerancy. From that, those assimilation of yeah. policies that we would nearly see today, Martin. And and I know both of you, and I know, Martin, you were part of the Committee of the Council of Europe. Just correct me if I'm wrong here, and I know, Thomas, I think you were on it. So if we just go on, I suppose, if you look at it in, at an international level, yeah. what ongoing efforts, because we cannot we cannot deny that that Commission caused so much, has, as I suppose, was a start to policies that we're still seeing today, you know, and they did not. They did not support the traveler community. If anything, they were totally anti-traveler. So, with that, what ongoing efforts, are, if any, are being made to address and strengthen the legal protection for the traveler community on a national and in and a European level, Martin? And uh, Thomas, I'm going to ask you to say put it on to you as well because I know both of you be involved. So, start with you first, Martin. You've been there for a few years now, and I know like Thomas took over from you. Just I suppose on the European level around the ethnicity. Yeah. Well, first of all, yeah, I, I I was a member of the Council of Europe uh, framework convention on the protection of national minorities. It's a committee of eighteen independent experts uh, dealing with indigenous uh, minorities and national minorities. And I was on that for five years, and it's great now that Thomas is is, is a member of that committee now as well. And to be to be quite straight, if it wasn't for that committee and indeed other international human rights organisations, both within the Council of Europe itself and within the Europe and within the UN, uh, I think the acknowledgement of travel ethnicity I don't think would have happened uh, as quick as it did. So these international human rights monitoring systems and their concluding observations and recommendations, and they made many many strong recommendations that the state should acknowledge travel ethnicity. Uh, if it wasn't for that international pressure. Uh, I don't think it would have happened as quick as it did. That's my opinion. So these international bodies are really, really important. And the Framework Convention on the Protection of National Minorities, in its last in its last report, its fourth report in Ireland, also went further and said the travel language uh, should be supported, uh, it should be revived, preserved, and passed on to the next generation. So it does make really important, uh, um, you know, recommendations. But you know, all these international bodies can do is make recommendations and advise uh government uh governments st states to do to do the right thing and then thereafter it's actually you know um it's up to each member state then to develop policies and strategies to move things forward uh it's not a matter for the international bodies uh their job is done as it were because there's a separation of powers obviously so international bodies make recommendations make observations the state then you know can work with those observations and recommendations and develop policies and strategies on them and sometimes they've done that other times they haven't done it but it's really important that traveler organizations you know make use uh really effective use of these international bodies and the recommendation and the recommendations that they make and to be fair i actually think the travel groups have made very good use because in all of our campaigning in all of our lobbying 
you know, we've cited these recommendations from the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So we have used it very effectively, I have to say, in our own lobbying, lobbying and campaigning here to get policies developed and implemented in partnership with Traber and Traber organisations. So these international bodies are absolutely essential, in my view, to our work in Ireland in advancing and protecting the rights of Travers. Okay. And Thomas, I suppose the fact now that you're there and like, you know, um, how is the European Union to work? And I you probably didn't say this, but I just want to say this anyway, to integrate Travers specific policies into broader Council of Europe um, and into, you know, into international human rights frameworks, because like the fact that it, what gets me, okay, is that it's just a recommendation. I mean, how, how would they, how do you think they'd go to kind of help them make those recommendations more, I suppose, like Ireland ratified, you know what I mean, the, the UN Convention, the, the, the National Minority Rights and the ratified it. But with that, Nissi, how can they enforce it to make it that little bit more uh, a legal protection for, for travellers, I suppose, you know? Excuse me. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as Martin said, it is a very dip diplomatic language that's used, but there is a process as well of visitation to the countries and meetings with the different stakeholders, including reports that's done. And then an opinion is formed by, say, for instance, the Framework Convention and the Protection of National Minorities. And there's a reading of that opinion at the Council of Europe. And I think that, in some ways, there's an exposure in that as well, you know, kind of. And, uh, and also it does give a platform. And I think that they don't take that lightly. I don't think national governments take that lightly. I think, I think they they would like to avoid it sometimes, or they like to step around it, or but they, they, they don't, they can't really avoid it. You know, they can't. That uh, there's a there's a committee of ministers, which is the, uh, the I think the, the tarnished is part of that uh, uh, committee of ministers in the Council of Europe, and that's who kind of uh, that's where the the the, the kind of the, that set up this framework. So they're kind of. It's part of that, and they've signed up to that, and the kind of you know, to, now some countries has has stepped out of it as well, Russia in more recent times, and and that, and uh, but but it really is a, a very, uh, uh, it's another kind of um, tool, and it's also at a broader level, and if you look at the, at the broader level as well in terms of Roma in in the rest of Europe, which is about twelve between anywhere between twelve and fourteen million Roma and travellers. In the rest of Europe, including the Sami people and others, there's many groups. Uh, like it, it's across that. So it's part of that kind of broader picture. What's happening to Roma and travellers as well, you know. So it's not like Ireland here. What's happening to travellers here? Yeah, it's happening to travellers here. But it's also happening to Roma and travellers in many other different countries in similar ways. Some more severe, some maybe a little bit less severe. But it's happening similar similar circumstances. And I think that. That's a, a broader framework that the Council of Europe and indeed the European Union is is looking at, you know, whether it's the Commission or the Parliament or whatever. And uh, kind of, you know, and if, to be part of a Europe, like it's underpinned by certain principles. So that's what some of the, you know, like human rights, for instance, and International Court of Human Rights is part of that framework as well. Mm -hmm. And and I suppose before, you know, the, before we finish up, I, I just want to find out in you, Martin, like it's been a long journey, you know what I mean? You say it's over 40 years and thankfully you haven't got tired because it's like- probably, it's, pro it's probably 50 years in Thomas's case. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you haven't got tired and, and I hope you haven't got tired because we need people like you. We need, you know, we need to inspire oh, the, the generations coming up. But I would I would want to find it from you, Martin. What do you think is, is the next steps on our road to ethnicity? Because it's not over yet, you know what I mean? It's only seven yeah. years. Yeah, I think, Nora, for me, there's even a point before that. And that is we have to do everything we can to ensure that there's a strong, independent traveller infrastructure mm -hmm. at local level and national level. And we need to do all we can to make sure that it's properly resourced and that it's independent of the state so we can continue to lobby and advocate and campaign for policy development and policy implementation. And I give NITRAS as an example of that. So I think that's something we need to keep an eye on is that infrastructure that we have developed over the last 40 years, you know, the, the 30, 40 local travel groups who are doing fantastic work at local level and then the number of national groups and all the rest of it. Uh, because, you know, we need to sustain, sustain the movement. That's really important. And to do that also, we need to be supporting, mentoring and nurturing 
young traveller activists, young men and women, you know, to support them to get involved and, and to continue uh, the struggle. So that's really key for me, I have to say. Yeah. And uh, and and then, as I, as I said earlier on, we got you know we got the symbolic recognition, and we now need need to see that also reflected in legislation. And I, and that is going to happen through the hate speech, hate crime legislation that's actually going through the Oireachtas. Yeah. Uh, Pavi Point, and I'm sure other groups have been involved in uh, proposing amendments and all the rest of it. So if that legislation goes through as it is presently drafted, there'll be an explicit recognition that travellers as, as a distinct ethnic group. And that would be the first time, actually, it will ever happen. Okay, we've had travellers mentioned in the Inside with the Hatred Act. We've had travellers mentioned in the 1998 Travel Accommodation Act. But it's not framed in terms of acknowledging travellers as an ethnic group. So with the hate speech, hate crime legislation, which in its own right is absolutely important because it's about tackling, you know, incitement of hatred and incitement of violence on the basis of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation. But within that, there'll be an explicit recognition of travellers as an ethnic group. And that'd be the first time, actually. So that's really, really important. So we're moving from the symbolic acknowledgement to the legal acknowledgement. Yeah. That is there's really good to know. And Thomas? Yeah, there's a risk involved as well. And I have, you know, I think the risks involved in this is that, you know, more opportunities will 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 happen for individual travellers. There'll be more kind of opportunities for individuals to progress as individuals. I think we have to keep a focus on on making sure that, and that could mean that individuals progress, but the community, the changes on the ground doesn't happen. And I think we have to be very careful. And I don't want to use technology, you know, technical language or that or kind of economic language, but that's a very neoliberal kind of uh, focus where the individuals progress, and but the community on the ground, the changes doesn't happen for the community on the ground. I think we need to make sure that we continue to politicize uh, travelers and kind of make sure that we create a strong collective voice uh, 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 among travelers. And that we, because if we take our eye off that, uh, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll say, well, look at this person over here, they're doing really well, you know, from the opportunity, whereas we don't get the changes on the ground, and yeah. I, you know, that's I'd I'd be very mindful of that, you know, kind of. I'm not saying there shouldn't be opportunities for individuals, but we need to be careful that it's not about individual individual collect. It's about collective uh, yeah. change that we're looking at. Absolutely, and I, I suppose one last thing before we finish up, and um, how do you feel about March first being, you know, recognised as an international traveller day? How do you feel about that? I, I, I personally think it, it is important that 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 we have that recognition as Mar March first. You know what do you think yourself, Martin? Well, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be uh, opposed to it, but uh, we do have Travel Pride Week. Yeah. You know, we we've had that for the last fourteen years, mm -hmm. so maybe we, you know, it, it could be maybe framed within that kind of context as well. Travel Pride Week, which incidentally is happening, has been launched. I think it's on the twentieth of May. Um. Um, this year, um, so yeah, I mean, I, now I do know that uh, that uh, that a number of travel organisations got together with a number of um, uh, English-based travel organisations to look at having a national travel day, and they did a bit of work around it. Mm -hmm. But I understand that there wasn't really a huge appetite at this time for it. Mm -hmm. So that committee that was convened by Rosemary Mohan and ITM has disbanded for now. Okay. It may reconvene again at a later stage, but they did a good bit of work around that and they had surveys and questionnaires and their conclusion was that at this time, there isn't a big appetite for it. But I think it is something, you know, down the line, you know, reconsidering and maybe frame it within Travel Pride Week or something like that. I, I'm open to it. Perfect. And, and yourself, Thomas? Yeah, I think I certainly wouldn't be, you know, opposed to it. I think it's it's a good idea. I think we need to kind of uh, make sure that 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 it is a that it is a community event that you know and I think that's I think there's a bit of work to be done and making sure that people are linked in around that and that it is celebrated when it does come about you know I think it's, it is going to take time to do that to get there but I I do think it's a good idea I think you know certainly it could be something that we could look at kind of um, you know uh, recognized by the European Union or something like that or that framework as you were talking about the European Union earlier on you know, kind of, because you know, as part of that, now there is an International Roma Day and that's, you know, can, that would need to be looked at. But I do think it's not, it's not a bad idea. You know? And I just want to say thank you very much for joining myself, Nora Corkin, here with the Global Travel Movement Visual Conversations. And once again, thank you, Martin Collins, and thank you, Thomas McCann. Thanks very much, Nora. Thank you.